Hello everybody, we are happy to see that so many people joined. This event is organized by Digital Pharma Lab and Hello Tomorrow. And uh, we'll also have some startups, some corporations, and also investors talking. I will be the representative for Hello Tomorrow as co-founder and CEO, so we, you will see me a few times. At Hello Tomorrow for five years, we've been organizing innovation challenges and events all over the world connecting thousands of startups with investors and corporations. The reason we do that is that we believe that science and technology can and should help solve the major issues we are facing, whether it is about living healthy or keeping our uh, planet healthy. Sorry, I will uh, turn my camera on. Um, and, and the current crisis triggered by the coronavirus proves if it was necessary that we constantly need research and innovation, not only to create more healthy products, but actually uh, rather to survive. So we are really happy and proud to join forces today with uh, Digital Pharma Lab today in the, in the future to make the pharmaceutical industry more connected and collaborative, which will lead to better healthcare for more people. So thank you again for joining us today. Some of you might already know us and work with us, and for the others, we hope that this is the beginning of a rich adventure together. Hi, everybody. I am Pascal Bekash, and I'm the co-founder of Digital Pharma Lab, and very happy to, to meet you all here. Uh, thank you, Arnaud, and we are very pleased uh, today to, to announce this partnership between the Digital Pharma Lab and the Hello Tomorrow. Um, with this partnership, we will uh, get an, an equal um, opportunity to all the pharmaceutical and the uh, medical device industry to really transform themselves thanks to digital. The crisis we leave uh, we reveals uh, the need of, uh, uh, of digital. Uh, digital is now uh, an obligation for, uh, for everybody, especially for this industry. And there are plenty of um, young company, innovative companies that are bringing innovation to you and uh, you just have to, to pick them the best possible way. And uh, Digital Pharma Lab as the first independent European accelerator of projects between innovative startups and uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies is very well positioned together with Hello Tomorrow to bring you this innovation. We really need to break the walls, the walls between patients and healthcare systems, the, bro the, the, the walls between um, hospitals and um, uh, general medicines. We need to break the walls uh, in, inside the pharmaceutical companies between um, the research and development, uh, the promotion of drugs, and get more closer to the patients. So it's very important to use what digital can bring us, uh, which is for the best. So I hope you will get a lot of information from this, uh, from this uh, uh, conference. And together with Arno, we are, we are so pleased to meet you and to welcome you in this new world. And to start with, uh, I'm very, very happy to host Clarisse Pagnès from uh, Johnson & Johnson, and more specifically, uh, GNG Pharmaceutical, uh, which is known as Janssen. So Clarisse, first of all, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about... Uh... Janssen, which is the, the pharmaceutical company of... Um of JNJ, um, we have um, quite a long standing history in innovation, especially in R&D, and we are quite structured here with the G-Labs, JNJ Venture Capitals, and a lot of acquisitions, not only in the biotech, but more and more also in health tech. Uh, but where we have innovated recently also in the past years, and even more in the past two years, is um, in the innovation and open innovation ecosystem um, that we are building step after step. Um, so there are quite a lot of great um, examples in some countries, uh, like France, uh, Israel also is doing a lot of stuff in the EMEA region, um, Italy, Spain, 
And what we have is uh, really a multi-hub innovation strategy. And now we are coordinating this with the innovation lab that we, are, we have opened at regional level uh, in Paris. So, um, so you are very well uh, positioned to tell us what kind of digital services can we envision for pharmaceutical industry, in your opinion? Well, I think, honestly, the, the, the story about service is not a new one. And I, no other industries have been experiencing that for almost decades for some of them. Uh, like software, IBM, uh, also as well as, as moved to a very product company into more, um, I would say, integrated, customer-centric, end-to-end solutions. Uh, so I think pharma is no exception there. Um, and um, and my, my, my thinking here is that the reason is that medicine has become, and you mentioned it a little bit in your introduction, Pascal, but um, medical science is now much more of a uh, holistic and integrated science right so when you make a decision about a treatment it's not really a treatment it's also you consider what is the autonomy of a patient how you will administer a drug what's the quality of life what how will you manage the side effect if it's an oral treatment and that kind of things right um and, and it, with the covid it's even getting further uh because we know that there is a, a big disruption going on with the social distanciation so the big rise and the big boom in telemedicine that um healthcare professionals are envisioning. So more and more, and, and even more than before, we need to understand how our drug will be administrated, how care is happening, because the drug is just a, a, a single step and a single piece of the whole pathway. Um, so we've, we've done the experience with, the, with our patient and, um, and our patient pathway and the molecules we, we uh, commercialize. And actually looking at the COVID impact of um, of our, our, on our patient pathway, we found out that about six out of 10 of our drugs are majorly disrupted by COVID. So either in the treatment decision, because we are bringing a treatment that is, uh, well, bringing some complications because it's a neural treatment and patients are fearing um, of not being able to track the patient well, or also in the administration or in the compliance. So it's, it's um, it's major and more than ever, we need to find out what are the right services to actually help the patient care uh, of the, of, uh, the HCP care of the patients. Um, so a lot of services to come. And I, I, my guess is that, yeah, telemedicine and, and working from remote for the, the, the healthcare professionals is, is going to be key in the upcoming two years. And uh, these are the new services you want to offer to your patients. but. What kind of economical model can you and uh, business model can you uh, uh, can you um, uh, find here? Because it's it's always very difficult for the, to to get uh, uh, to get the, the 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 real value of uh, of digital, especially in countries that, that are uh, so uh, so ruled like uh, European ones. Yeah, honestly, that's the billion dollar question, Pascal. <laughs> of um, course, I. I sh I'm, I'm, I have to, to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so honestly, the economic model has always been a struggle for farm. And, and for me, it's because we have been always hesitating or there is a tension between two objectives uh, for the services and solutions. The one first objective is we want to, to, to build services for exactly the reason I was mentioning before. So use a service as a differentiator on the patient pathway versus other treatments. Uh, but also to increase adherence, so to increase prescriptions, fulfillment of prescriptions, and so on. And, and that's the first way of, I would say, getting the payback, payback of a service or a solution, um, which more than ever is going to be important. And I, I could take the example of CAR T cells, um, where basically we are not only selling a, a, a molecule in that sense, it's more a process that we sell. And, and the, what we learned from the, the new um, launches that happened in the US very recently is that, well, caregivers and, and site of care, they will, are more likely to maybe uh, get one, two, three different sales providers, but no more, not definitely not 10, because it will be too complex for their operations. So the service and the platform we will bring to actually follow the sales, track where, when the sales will be delivered, what, well, the, the, uh, the I would say the logistics path as well as the, the treatment and the patient services around this uh, are going to be critical differentiator and that's part of our model. But also what we are trying to do with services more and more and, and solutions is to master the data because what, what, um, what is important for us as farm is 
because we only are providing a, a small piece of the patient pathway, which is the molecule and the treatment, what, we're, what we all love, would love to do and would um, dream to do is to be the integrator of all the services and the solutions on the pathway. Um, and, and the second economic model that, that is definitely arising, but it takes time, is getting some reimbursement directly for the service or the solutions. And we see some good examples already coming in, in the past two years. Um, and, and some competitors also in the US got that uh, two years ago. So we see definitely this is coming, um, but it's, uh, it requires also for the health authority to move. And again, I believe that, well, with the new health tech uh, and digital therapeutics that come and that are being reimbursed as well as this, some, some treatments like the, C, the, the CAR T cells. I think this is going to move the lines in the authorities between molecules, a device, and, and a combination of both. So um, as we have a, a little bit more of time, I will ask you some questions that we didn't prepare. So uh, don't be surprised, Clarisse. <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to know that if, if um, outside Europe, you, have, you may have a, a, an eye also outside Europe, um, if things are very different outside Europe, so uh, um, especially uh, in uh, the ability for a company like yours to provide the full, uh, full healthcare solution to patients. Yeah, the, the, the landscape is not exactly the same and the internal, so the, our strategy is very region based, um, to be honest. And that's also because we are a very decentralized company. Uh, but definitely what we see in the US and also in Latin America is, um, is a, a very different uh, regulation for patient data. Um, so what we can provide as a company on the value is, is sometimes a little bit more straightforward than in Europe, where we see that there is no uh, well, the landscape is a little bit more scattered first across different uh, countries, but also um, there is, uh, well, and, and I'm not giving any judgment here, but we might be happy about this as well. Uh, there are some strong relations, regulations on the data privacy, privacy, but also less, it's not only the regulation, it's also the appetite of customers. I mean, we see it with the COVID crisis. Um, I mean, there's a lot of pushback in Europe from the citizens about being tracked uh, on their data, medical data. So it, it's it's not um, it's not only regulation; it's cultural, I would say. And and the big difference as well is the ecosystem, the, the local ecosystem. Um, so when we look, for instance, at China, there is a, a big, uh, big, big app, uh, which is kind of integrating a lot of services and creating a little bit more easy end-to-end, -end, uh, well, integration of solutions. Uh, we don't have that, and I, I don't believe for the reasons of um, data privacy and ecosystem that we will get there in Europe, at least not really not soon. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, a different ways of, of approaching innovation, I would say. Okay, for sure. Uh, so uh, I, I would like to know uh, what are uh, the, for you, the interest to work with uh, innovative startup? How can how can these innovative startups uh, can bring value to your company and how can they uh, enforce the digital transformation? Yeah, I think one of my motto uh, is coming from the Facebook little Ray book, uh, which is if, if I paraphrase, so for Facebook, it's if we don't create the thing that kills Facebook, someone else will, right? But that's the same for farm. If we don't kill the thing, if we don't create the thing that will kill farm, uh, well, someone else will, and especially uh, GAFAM in combination with all the acquisitions they are doing right now in the, um, in the ecosystem. Um, so for me, it's, it's just a matter of survival to work uh, with, with all the ecosystems to find solutions. Um, because there is no way, even as, as a big farm, I mean, we've been looking at the R&D investment and, and, and completely, so if I take the R&D investment for j, &J which includes also the... Um, the acquisitions that we are making, uh, and we are making a lot more and more in health tech. Uh, we, we are about the same level of, uh, or at least in comparable ranges as GAFAMs um, and in health. Um, so, I mean, there is a lot of money here. Um, so, of course, for acquisitions, but that's not going to be enough because when you think of the patient pathway, um, we, we, will, um, we are bringing a lot of know-how, money, 
uh, knowledge about the commercial operations, knowledge about market access and so on, and, and, and knowledge about the care itself. But there is no way that as a whole, as a single company, we can also bring uh, all the expertise on data, uh, real world evidence um, and, and, and data tracking, data privacy, digital user experience. I mean, that's a lot of expertise that we need to combine. And if we want to survive, I believe that we, we there is no choice but to really build bridges and overcome barriers, right? So build the bridges with the other uh, actors. So remove the wall, build the bridges. But um, are you ready? I mean, uh, you you are here, Clarice, and thank you for this terrific conversation, and uh, thank you for being so so direct and frank. But honestly, uh, uh, pharmaceutical company are they ready in terms of uh, uh, skills and uh, competencies to 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 welcome this uh, innovation from uh, pharma tech startups and deep tech startups? I think it's a journey, like a, a lot of things. It's shaking us a little bit. Um, the good news is that we have the experience on the R&D side. I mean, open innovation in R&D for molecules had been there for, I would say, now decades. Um, at least in JNJ, we started beginning of, of years 20, uh, 2000. So it's it's still, we understand basically the value of going outside for R&D. So now it's transposing to other parts of our business. Um, so I wouldn't say we are completely ready. I think we need to um, also think of different way of doing it, uh, acquiring also some skills. So the, the countries that are building some great uh, stories there, like France, it's because also we have specialists coming from the startup environment to speak the same language. Um, and, and also it's, um, yeah, it's a journey. Uh, and we also need maybe to, to go even shake us ourselves even further like a building consortiums um not going only just a once uh one shot collaboration with one startup but thinking more global and thinking more um consortiums in those partnerships yeah well uh, um, speaking more global and more uh, consortium is uh, is very new in the pharmaceutical and uh, medical device industry um are you sure that everybody is ready for that no, again, it's a journey. Uh, we need to show the way. Uh, there are good examples um, also and, and good partnerships that have been announced. I mean, at least I could see the, the, the change in the mindset and I think COVID crisis will, that will be a, at least one of the good outcomes uh, of this crisis is to, uh, well, think a little bit more out of the box. And I could see in my company at least that there is a, a much bigger push um, from the, um, the top management to think uh, external, not only uh, looking internal. And that's why also we created the lab uh, in Paris. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic. Okay, I've got reasons. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's very interesting. I have one more question, then uh, we will uh, uh, go forward. Um, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, today, you know, um, it's uh, working with the startups, uh, Pharma tech and, and deep tech startups is very, very different from working, for instance, with biotech uh, startups. And, and how far is the difference and uh, how would you characterize this difference? Well, the, um, one of the things that has been difficult, I can speak for our experience um, it, with the France, French OPCO, and then at regional level, is finding the right topic to collaborate. Um, sometimes we want to go very deep very specific but we lose a little bit the creativity of the startup so finding that right balance be between having a, so finding the right topic to collaborate on is for me very critical which is a little bit less of a problem i would say for biotech uh, because we are making some acquisitions of, on on a science on, on a product or on a molecule uh on a pipeline so here it's uh i would say yeah it, it's a little bit more um um you need to shape a little bit more, I would say, uh, with health tech as well, on what problems you want to solve. Uh, and it's not a given. So, um, so I would say Okay, that's okay, last, last. Okay. Last, for sure, um, you are selling, you are saying that uh, uh, you, you, if you, if you don't create what can kill uh, Janssen, uh, someone will kill Janssen. So said, can you get uh, can you give us an example of something you created that could kill could kill Janssen? 
Um, I think there are different things. Yes, we are working on the um, identification of uh, biomarkers for treatments uh, in the lab. So especially um, looking into um, how we can isolate uh, some bio, some eligibility for some biotherapies uh, in immunology. Um, we are working also on, on some of uh, um, um, services for um, uh, patients and, and for HCPs, especially one um, that is about uh, bringing peer uh, interactions that is kind of bypassing Jensen uh, directly. So I think there are a lot of things here. Uh, that's, that's also a difficulty that we need to see beyond, I would say, the short okay. term uh, in this kind of uh, innovations. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Clarice, for this very, very uh, wonderful insight, and uh, thanks again. And uh, I will now pass the, the, the word to, uh, to Arnaud de Latour, my, uh, our, uh, our, our camarade here, and Arnaud is here. Uh, before before uh, Vincent introduced our, our common program, I wanted to explain in a minute why we started to work together and how uh, how it's uh, how it started. In the end, at Hello Tomorrow and Digital Pharma Lab, we want to achieve the same thing, which is to help startups, uh, the investors, and pharma companies create value together for all stakeholders. And when you want to achieve the same thing, and there is uh, business involved, it's always tricky as. Uh, you are either complementary, or if not, then you are it means you are competitors. Uh, so when we discussed, I quickly realized that actually we were complementary. As uh, at Hello Tomorrow, our key asset is our worldwide community uh, with thousands of startups, investors, and, and, and corporations uh, all over the world. And our competitive edge then is really to be able to match those organizations uh, all over the world. While uh, for Digital Pharma Lab, it's a little bit the, uh, the next part of the story, uh, which, which is, uh, I would say, your assets, but you can, you can confirm, as uh, you have really the experience of accelerating those collaborations between tech startups and pharma companies. As you, you specialized in, in doing this before everyone else found out this was the, the right thing to do. Um, so, I really think that together by combining our most successful programs, the Hello Tomorrow Challenge that we organized to do the matching and uh, your acceleration program, we can provide something to the pharmaceutical industry that is truly unique as it is end to end, going from the matching to also the, the, the acceleration of the collaboration to really think about the return on investment and, and really the output of the collaboration. And it is also focused and interdisciplinary, so focus because we start from concrete issues that uh, pharmaceutical companies are facing, but also interdisciplinary because we are able to leverage a network that goes well beyond the pharmaceutical industry. And as Clarice just said, um, now pharmaceutical industries and companies need to also leverage skills and solutions that are not in their traditional core business. So in this perspective, it's interesting to see what other industries are developing and bring them, bring those solutions to the pharmaceutical industries. Uh, and finally, uh, we are able to do something that is really international as we uh, can leverage our common network uh, present in more than 50 countries. So um, I'm really excited to this, uh, this collaboration. And um, I, I think I will let Vincent walk you through this uh, uh, this program and also more generally into the pharmatic revolution. Thank you, Arno, uh, for the introduction. So, yes, I'm uh, Vincent Galland, um, partner at Digital Pharma Lab and uh, head of innovation. 
So yeah, I will just share my screen uh, to share you some uh, presentation about what uh, uh, we do and about the program. So just a second. Um, so I hope you can see it now. Okay. So first of all, before discussing about the program we have been creating together with Hello Tomorrow, I would just speak about to you about uh, some words about the pharmatech revolution because it's really uh, the core of what we are doing. So just a few words about pharmatech. Maybe you never heard about uh, this word. Uh, so why you can see this is because it's really the shock of two worlds and um, Formatic can be defined as uh, software and data-driven companies that provides new ways of doing business for the uh, pharmaceutical and life sciences industry. So these companies offer strategic opportunity to revolutionize this industry, um, especially throughout the value chain and ensuring a high level of competitiveness. So what we do and what we say is that um, the different uh, startups and pharma tech startups are, are innovating and uh, uh, help to face uh, the challenges of the traditional pharmaceutical industry. So you can see here on the left, uh, different startups uh, that are inside the value chain of the pharmaceutical companies. So like in R&D, a new treatment discovery in clinical trials in compliance, but also the pharma tech startups propose new solutions that are competing or completing the traditional pharmacopoeia, as said Clarice before. So they are creating new games and, um, uh, you know, like you can find here uh, different uh, startups like Diabeloop, Movecare. Uh, Movecare is very interesting because this startup uh, got a medical device uh, um, uh, certification and will be reimbursed uh, by the French government. Um, to help uh, follow the different cancer patients. So all these companies are part of the pharmatech and is what we are specializing in today. So just the key statistics about unicorns. Um, as you know, unicorns are those startups that are valued by mo more than $1 billion. Um, uh, and we call them unicorns because they are very rare in the startup landscape and all the investors are trying to invest, of course, in those startups that will become uh, unicorns. So we made a very short um, uh, like um, study about the, the, the unicorns in the pharma tech uh, sector, and we found that 31 unicorns are existing today. Um, 15 billion have been invested by the major VC of um, um, digital um, economy. Uh, sorry, just a second. These unicorns represent a total valuation of 113 billion, um, and it's accounting for 8.6% of the total value of unicorns uh, globally. So I will just show you this. If you see here, the pharmaceutical industry um, represents 1.4% of the world economy in 2018. Um, but the pharmatech unicorns uh, represent much more. 8.6% of the total unicorns value, which means that the pharma tech could multiply the value of the pharma industry by six. It's a really uh, very interesting uh, game to be. And we think unicorns in pharma tech um, to grow by five uh, over the next five years. So it's really a niche and it's really a very added value um, uh, sector. Just very fast, we, in our study, we also a check the, all the unicorns. I told you there's 31 in the pharma tech sector, and we can see they are mostly in the very high end of the value chain of the pharmaceutical industry in R and D. Uh, but also they are in um, information and education. So um, some pharma companies entered into the capital of these unicorns. For example, Yunbeck uh, in the capital of uh, um, of benevolent AI. Amgen in the capital of Oxford Nanopore and Celgen in the capital of human longevity. So um, what I want to say is that startups are emerging to provide all types of solutions across the healthcare industry from improving patient care to uh, designing new therapeutics. And 
um, the development of uh, these solutions relies on the capacity to create innovative and effective business models. So if you want to know more about this, we made a, a very complete uh, study um, the last uh, few months. Um, you can find uh, the study um, by uh, our internet website in Digital Pharma Lab, but you can write me as well if you're interested in this study. You can find here the, the agenda with all the description of the 31 uh, different unicorns. And uh, we also have a critical thinking about the different model of collaborations between uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies and startups. So it's very interesting and uh, I really encourage you to, to check this study that we called the shock of two worlds, pharma and tech. So now about the program. Uh, so the Global Pharma Booster Program is a five months global program that uh, leveraged the pharma tech startup to accelerate the health industry business. Uh, why we created this program is because on this 31 uh, unicorns, Mostly they are in USA uh, and Asia and um, some of them in Europe, but not in France. And uh, there's only four to six uh, unicorns in Europe anyways. So we see there's a high potential of collaborating uh, with uh, startups uh, in Europe and globally, um, but it's not enough. So what we want to do uh, with this program is to connect the different players, the industrial, so the pharmaceutical company, medical device manufacturers, CEOs, and other companies, the pharma tech startups as well, of course, and in, uh, obviously the different uh, investors and venture capitalists. So the program actually will last five months and uh, on three main, um, uh, let's say three main uh, phases. The first one uh, is matching. So we'll hear your different business problems and we will find startups that can help you solve those problems. Um, so we'll have access to uh, Hello Tomorrow to the largest international pharma tech and deep tech startups community. And this is really the, 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 the key uh, asset of, the, of Hello Tomorrow. Um, so we'll have some matching, we will we'll present you some startups and uh, it will really work well. Then you will have uh, uh, alignment and, um, and a sprint during uh, uh, three months and three weeks. So uh, you will have, um, how to say, different uh, uh, meetings with those startups and we'll um, uh, define the governance. And, uh, and then uh, you will be able to, uh, uh, to, to, to work with them and I will show you later. And then for one week, you will have virtual business trips if uh, you want to, uh, that can leverage your experience in building um, uh, business collaborations. That means um, if you want to discover other um, incubators or how to say like different startups, you will be able to um, create for you different um, virtual business trips. So I will not get into very details. If you are interested, then I can uh, uh, show you uh, later. But what is important is that you also have a communication stream uh, below. So it's not only the matching, working with those startups, but also uh, communicating. And this is very important because through the work with uh, pharma tech startups, it will also motivate and uh, uh, help the, the different employees uh, to, to, to work with you. So just a few words about our industrial partners today. It's not uh, uh, something uh, we've just been creating. Uh, we are leveraging about our experiences in uh, doing this program. And for now, we have different uh, industrial partners. Uh, first, Biogen, of course, uh, you will see, uh, you will be able to hear Thibaut Guimard later. And uh, we can say Biogen really helped us to, to design the program. Uh, and also some global companies and uh, local affiliates already participated to this program. And, uh, and uh, I can tell you they are fully satisfied about the way uh, we work and the way we design collaborations. And this is just a, a view of different startups we have been working with. I will not detail all of them, but uh, just to say that we have a, a wide array of different technologies. And this is just to put you some concrete examples of the different uh, pharma tech projects that are ongoing today. Uh, I cannot tell you right now which companies with which startup, but just to have a view about like different topics. It can go to real world data. Um, it can go to uh, 
uh, optimizing the different, uh, um, how to say, the different um, uh, clinical trials. It can, use, it can be to use machine learning to uh, correlate and predict behaviors based on DNA uh, and such. So really we have uh, today like 15 projects going on and, um, and it's just the beginning. So if you're interested in this program, please don't hesitate to uh, contact me or Arnaud, of course, or Pascal. Uh, and, um, and I will be happy to, 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 to speak to you more about the program. And also the program will start uh, idly in July. So if, you, if you're interested, um, just uh, write us uh, now. So here it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vincent and Arnaud, and uh, thank you. It's now a, a great pleasure uh, to, uh, to welcome uh, Thibaut Guimard. Uh, as you said, Vincent, uh, Thibaut and Biogen uh, was our uh, first customer in Digital Pharma Lab and uh, one of the most famous, and they help us a lot. And they are still helping us because I guess uh, they are satisfied. So, uh, Thibault, uh, stage is yours. Hi, Pascal. Hi, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, I'm um, within Biogen. I'm leading um, the product and strategy of a unit that is called uh, BHS. So, I'll share a little bit about that. I'll share about my experience with Digital Pharma Lab and also a little bit of what we are looking for for the next steps. So can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. So uh, just for those of you that may not know uh, very specifically uh, what Biogen is and what we are doing. So Biogen is, um, is uh, one of the first uh, global biotechnology company. This is uh, a company that is uh, really focused on neuroscience uh, we are pioneers in that space in neuroscience and um, since a little bit more than two years now we've been creating a unit uh, that is uh, called biogen healthcare solutions which is really about pioneering in neuroscience but in the digital space um, of neuroscience so this is really where this team is truly uh, concentrating his effort within biogen and outside of biogen now with uh, with the startups so as I said, this has been created in um, 2018. Uh, this is a global digital unit. So we are based in Paris, but we are operating um, in uh, more than 11 markets now and 15 markets by the end of the year. Uh, we are focusing, like I was saying, in neurodigital health and medicine as well uh, solutions. So you, you will hear about it. Um, we are now more than 45 people um, based at home, but close to Paris. And um, currently, and uh, the team is growing pretty fast currently, um, we have uh, two projects uh, that are now on the market in more than 10 countries, and we have uh, three projects in the pipeline. So what we do at BHS is really to focus on solutions that can solve um, customer problems. So ATPs are patient problems. Um, projects that can have a global scale and solutions that can truly have a global scale. We are not interested in something that can be only launched in France or in Germany or in the US, but truly things that we can uh, completely scale uh, throughout the world. But also something that can um, really um, drive trust and value uh, differentiation. Um, this is uh, solutions that are not promotional, meaning that this is not linked in any way to our products. So this is not about promoting uh, directly or indirectly our uh, medications, but this is really about adding value uh, to our current offer or create new types of offerings for our customers. Um, it's obviously um, driven, I would say, or leveraging digital technology, and this is absolutely aligned uh, with Biogen's strategy in neuroscience. This is where we want to be uh, the best. So um, in terms of the portfolio of solutions that we have created right now, so we have um, two solutions, so Clio and Neurodium that are in the market today. Um, those solutions, we call them digital health platforms. Um, so you have Clio on one side, which is um, an app that is here to support people living with uh, multiple sclerosis. 
Uh, it's now uh, the number one global MS app. Um, so it's available, yes, in more than 10 countries and, and soon in 15, but it's already number one in the countries where it's available. Um, then uh, we have Neurodium, uh, where we have a product that is uh, in some countries number one, in others number two or number three. There is a huge competition in that space, but our goal is to make it the number one reference amongst the, neuro the neurologists and the HEPs in neuroscience. And this is basically a platform that helps HEPs and neurologists get access to the best science and um, scientific information in neuroscience, uh, covering more than 18 subdomains of, of uh, neurology. Um, so that product has been launched less than two years ago. It's, it's now probably one year of 15 months ago, and it's already uh, very well integrated in some markets. Like uh, some of them, you have uh, more than uh, 20, 30, or even sometimes close to 50% of the neurologists that are already registered and using it. And then um, we've been working last year, uh, and that's the, the new part of the, of the BHS portfolio, where we are now building uh, what we call digital measurement solutions. So we are working on medical devices. And that space is a new space that we are going to announce this year, where we have already one solution that we have created with one startup based in France. And uh, that's kind of an illustration of how we want to work in the future, where we are going to partner with different startups to try to accelerate our pace in the digital space and create products, uh, common products or solutions that can have a global scale uh, and a global impact. So the, I would say how we are able to do that, I think it's coming from one important thing because the resources is something that many and most of the pharmaceutical companies can have. Uh, we can find money, we can have people. Uh, but the big issue within um, pharmaceutical companies and, and the way we can interact with startups, bigger or smaller ones, is to make sure that you have the same DNA and the same uh, way of uh, collaborating. So here, as you can see on this slide, um, this is kind of uh, what is BHS. We are not a startup, but we are acting as a startup and uh, that is incubated within Biogen. Uh, we have this DNA of people coming from startup within our organization. Um, we have probably more of people outside of pharma than people of pharma, but we need a good mix of all of them uh, to make sure that we have a strong uh, connection within Biogen and that people understand what we are doing for uh, what we're doing and why we're doing it within a, a, a pharmaceutical company, but also making sure that we have also the right people to be uh, able to execute those projects, but also to collaborate uh, with uh, startups and people that have a different way of acting. So this is really about performance. We're focusing on the performance of our solution, on the speed of execution, in launching the solutions, but also in building the solutions. Uh, this is really about the agility, so making sure that even if we are in a big company, we stay lean and simple in the way we act, but that we can also take some risks. Um, obviously, as you can see, and it's, it's in French at the bottom, but uh, in making sure that we respect all the regulations, of course, and the rules that we have internally, but making sure that we have the spirit of, of taking some risks. Um, on, on what we try to do. And then obviously have some fun because we're here also to make sure that uh, uh, we have a team of people that does that in, in the good spirit. Going uh, to the open innovation, um, I think uh, that the collaboration with the Digital Pharma Lab is really about helping uh, Biogen and DHS starting to uh, enter this open innovation uh, world, I would say, where uh, currently with the project, the project I mentioned, K, um, I think this project has been done uh, with some uh, very positive outcomes, but also some uh, heavy learning sometimes. And I think uh, it's really uh, interesting in an organization that doesn't have uh, today an open innovation, uh, I would say, um, vehicle, uh, to make sure that within BHS, we are also equipped to accelerate our activity on the open innovation side and make sure, I think uh, this is what, where it's been very successful, uh, helping us um, scout and identify the right startups where we have needs and then making sure that we stay connected to them and with that we work on something very concrete to try to um, bring it to the next level within Biogen or within BHS. So some of the outcomes and what we've done in the first season uh, of Digital Pharma Lab. So as you can see here, we've been uh, working with uh, three, uh, three startups um, in a period of three to four months. 
Uh, the first one, Diam Park, uh, was even not a, a startup at the very beginning. It was kind of a big idea. And uh, throughout our collaboration, they've been building the company. We've been helping them in, in, in thinking about this, this design. But also, uh, we've been learning from them in a space where we, we are not focusing yet in terms of solutions, but that we will in the future, which is uh, Parkinson. So um, this is a place where in uh, after those four months, we are still as they are building their proof of concept, uh, we're waiting for the scientific validation of the proof of concept to be able potentially to move to the next step with them. Then we have Inato, which is, which is a startup that is helping uh, pharmaceutical companies to try um, to accelerate their clinical operations and their uh, clinical trials activity. So here, um, BHS has not the expertise of doing that, even if we are now, uh, for medical devices reasons, um, also partnering on our clinical trials. But um, we, are, we don't have this expertise, so we've been uh, connecting to our clinical operations teams within Biogen, and the idea was to give them a business opportunity within Biogen. And finally, uh, we are, so as you have heard, we are building health, uh, digital health platforms, we are building now uh, medical devices, but what we envision as a next step and an area where Biogen is very interested is to make sure that we also are potentially going to identify and to partner with the right digital therapeutics companies. And um, Lucine is one that is based in France that it's pretty interesting that we found uh, that could uh, that may have a fit with Biogen at some point. So we've been discussing with them on that. And this is a long uh, run, I would say. Uh, it's not something that you can do in three to four months uh, because uh, building a digital therapeutics takes three to five or maybe 10 years. So uh, to make sure that we were there, we are partnering with uh, them on now building a potential collaboration agreement where we are starting to discuss in an area that we have identified. So that's the outcome of the season one. When it comes to the season two, so uh, Biogen and BHS, we decided to move into uh, the next steps as well. And also uh, to have people of BHS uh, partnering with um, new uh, types of startups. So here, as you can see, we have started some discussions with uh, three um, startups, two of them are here, and one needs to be announced, but um, we have Okin with whom we have started to discuss, but uh, we just had one meeting, uh, like with uh, 360 Medlink, so one or two meetings. So we need additional discussions to make sure that we clarify our needs and that we have potentially opportunities to collaborate together. Uh, but there are areas, for example, with Okin, where we think that their AI and digital, um, I would say, data science expertise could be leveraged on uh, our new projects that we are going to disclose soon and, and, and to launch um, in, uh, in some of our uh, core biogen activities. So that's for the season two of Digital Pharma Lab. So what's next for BHS and for biogen? I think what we are so transparently to tell all the people that are listening to us right now. So um, it can be uh, the VCs, but also the investors and, and the people here from, the, um, from uh, the startups, especially just to tell you that we are going to, um, we are currently thinking about strengthening our open innovation strategy. Um, so Digital Pharma Lab is a, is a strong part of what we want to achieve. We have a global scale. So I think this uh, meeting today is great because this is a, a big announcement and, and that will help us also have a, a bigger access to and a better access to what's happening in the US and in Asia, for example, where uh, we are also operating. Um, and then it's uh, really to make sure that you, the neurotech startups, so we are not interested in all the startups, but the ones that can help us um, um, position or accelerate our projects in the neurotech space. So what we call neurotech is the neuroscience, neurology uh, side and space of um, companies that do digital and technology. And so we're looking for the best international neurotech startups and partners. And then we are also looking for creating new opportunities, like I was saying, to accelerate the 
digital solutions of our pipeline. So the Project K, for example, but also others that we have in our pipeline that are going to be focusing in three main areas at this stage, and it will evolve in the future. But Alzheimer's disease, we, you have probably heard about Biogen and Alzheimer's. So this is an area where we're going to focus. Then MS, which is part of um, the DNA of Biogen, and SMA, of course, where we have also a strong um, offerings for our customers at this stage. So um, thank you for that. Um, I don't know if you have uh, questions. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I turn to Arnaud, uh, uh, one and only question, because uh, we are running a little bit out of time. So uh, do you think, Thibaut, that uh, Digital Therapeutics, our uh, partner or competitor for uh, the pharmacopoeia of, uh, of uh, Biogen? Honestly, I don't see that at this at this stage, I would say uh, it's not a competitor. It's um, it's an added value. It's a space that is not is not really well um, entirely, completely, I would say, regulated, but also clarified in what it can do and 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 cannot do. We don't know. There is a lot of science that needs to be uh, produced as well. Um, most of what we've seen in the market today is related to um, behavioral. I would say. Um, um, therapies. Um, so when it comes to make it a true uh, therapeutic that could have a, a very strong impact, um, we are looking for the scientific data to come out and to learn from that. But I think we are very interested as being um, saying that we are pioneers in neuroscience and in, in digital neuroscience to make sure that we are at the very beginning, um, that we can also uh, be part of accelerating that path and identifying the right uh, digital therapeutics companies in our space uh, that we could accelerate so that they can find uh, their customers and their markets uh, together with us uh, to be true partners and uh, not competitors in the future. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Thibault. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, these great uh, these great insights again, and thank you, uh, thank you for being our uh, our big partner. So, uh, Arno. Yes. Um, so I wanted to introduce why we organize startup challenges to do the matching between startups and uh, more mature companies. Uh, actually, the reason is pretty simple: is that it's impossible. Um, there are so many emerging technologies and so many startups that it's impossible to um, know all the technologies and all the solutions that are developed. So rather than, or on top of doing the traditional scouting and, and using databases and so on, uh, we reverse how it works. And actually we start by defining what are the strategic topics or what are the challenges that you need to solve. And then we share them within our startup network and community. And for them it's business opportunities, so they are quite eager to answer and to uh, suggest the, the solutions. So we'll, I will give uh, one concrete example. Um, the, the person who uh, was supposed to do discuss with me couldn't make it, but it was okay because we did this project together. So uh, I, will, I, will, I will present it by myself. Uh, this is uh, actually in, uh, not in the healthcare industry, it's in the nuclear industry. And uh, it's, so it's, um, uh, but it doesn't matter because the, the process is the same and actually it's even better because it, it will allow you to understand what is important. I will, I will try to be quick. Um, so what uh, we, we had the initial brief, uh, which was quite ambitious of uh, reinventing the nuclear industry. Ambitious because of this, con this complex challenges and issues, but also because we have seen that the nuclear industry is not where the there is the most disruption happening. Uh, but actually uh, it, it was not a reason for them to stand still and, and they were right. So uh, what we did is we, we started uh, to organize a workshop with the innovation team, but also the, uh, the business units. It's, it's very important to involve the businesses uh, from the beginning because uh, in the end, it's, it's about business uh, also when we talk about innovation. And if the, the business units are not able to dedicate a few hours to do a workshop initially to define what are the strategic topics, most likely they won't have time to follow up with the startup for the collaborations and uh, it will be a dead end. So uh, this is really um, my, the first uh, takeaway. So um, businesses should be involved from the beginning. And in this workshop, we also define what would be the value proposition for the startup. And uh, 
Here again, our general rule that we, we always apply when we organize startup challenges is to try to get away from, um, from the cash prize for the startups because then they will, they, will, they will apply for the wrong reason to get some money and then you uh, not to actually work with you. So uh, what we did uh, actually is to uh, we created a fast track, a business collaboration fast track with uh, one dedicated point of contact, access to the um, network of uh, Orano and the experts, internal experts of Orano, and access also to testing infrastructure. Uh, so that's... Um, that was the, the value proposition for all the startups that would be selected. And uh, we then shared a communication kit. So uh, what I'm showing to you now is the, uh, actually the brochure that we shared to the startups. And uh, we, uh, we, had, we had, uh, around 100 applications, uh, and the original team narrowed it down to 50. And, and, and then, uh, Orano's innovation teams and business teams, uh, did a, a selection of 15 startups with whom they did some calls uh, to, to deep dive in what would be the use case, uh, concretely what would be the business case and, 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 and what the potential collaboration would look like. And uh, based on this work, the startups were able to pitch um, uh, during the final that happened uh, mostly digitally uh, as the, uh, because of the coronavirus. Actually, I will, I will show a little a little movie of what the, the final look looked like. Um, so um, this this final was oops, sorry. I don't know if you have some. Oh, no. oh, there should be there should be some anyway. So the the um, this final was uh, was not really to award a prize and select a winner because again. Prize, but it's more it's more a ritual to uh, create momentum internally and uh, to make sure that those collaborations start on a, on a, with a strong and, and positive energy. Um, so today, um, today they um, I will cut the sound. So today they they uh, actually started to collaborate with uh, five of the startups. Um, some, uh, some of them that will uh, actually work on those big new business of, uh, of Orano uh, outside the, the, industry, the traditional uh, energy industry, so in healthcare or, pharma or space even, and uh, three others that uh, will actually be uh, working with other business units as it's more concrete and short term impact on the business that is expected. Um, so this was, uh, this was one, uh, one of the examples and now, uh, I will let the so the the DJ and, and the, uh, the speakers talk about the perspective from uh, different ecosystem in Europe and Asia about the uh, the health tech ecosystem. That's done. Okay, thank you. So now let's travel. Uh, we know that uh, the world is uh, changing. And um, so I have with me a few persons that are coming from uh, different parts of the world. And uh, first I have uh, Sebastian Bagdi, uh, who is uh, from Singapore and uh, Bangkok. Uh, Sebastian, are you with us? And can you uh, Hello. Uh, start your, your camera? Hello. Is it, can you see me? Hello, you... Hello Sebastian. Sure. So yes. can you, uh, uh, Sebastian, can, can you introduce yourself and uh, tell where you are in particular? <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm Sebastian. I'm um, founder and CEO of Excel. We are a rare cell detection company, particularly um, uh, targeting early cancer screening. And today I'm calling from our uh, clinical R&D hub and registered clinic in Bangkok in Thailand, our headquarters in Singapore. Uh, Singapore uh, mastered the crisis very well in the beginning, then ran into some trouble. So um, I, I decided to relocate to Bangkok. Um, part of my team is still in Singapore and uh, the other part is actually in Germany. 
so we are, have truly spread out over the over the globe. Well, thank you, Sebastian. We will come uh, to you in a few minutes. Uh, so I have also with uh, with us uh, so Nuno Viegas, who is uh, from uh, VCOE, who is part of uh, EIE Health, and who is uh, from of course. Um, Nuno, are you with us? Good morning. How are you? So, Nuno, can you uh, also introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name is Nuno Viegas. I uh, work as investment manager at uh, the European Institute for Innovation and Technology in France. Um, and uh, we are right now um, working to start a new uh, funding mechanism for uh, late stage companies in Europe. But at the same time, in the previous three years, I was actually still inside EIT Health, working on um, with with early stage uh, startups and supporting them, supporting them with acceleration, acceleration, but also with funding. Okay, great. And uh, so we have also with us uh, Adam Zhao, who is uh, Chinese, but uh, uh, in fact, he was not able to uh, to be live uh, this morning. So we have a short uh, video uh, with, uh, with Adam. So um, can uh, we start the, the video? Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, 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 my name is Adam Zhao. I'm the uh, partner for Unlong Math. I started my own fund, Unlong, in 2016. And the fund is about $100 million. We invest about uh, 40 company by this time. Uh, we among those 40 companies, about uh, six, or six or five are uh, digital house. So we have a very, uh, very uh, sensitive uh, uh, fields in this area and how this area is going to be, uh, we discuss this intensively among our team. And so you know very well what's the situation in China and you know very yeah. well what's, uh, the digital health uh, system. Maybe can can you share maybe a, a few things about what's the situation today uh, in mm -hmm. Beijing in China? Uh, is there still uh, the pandemic? Uh, do you uh, work as usual? Yeah, I, actually, uh, I I think that's one of the benefit of working as a uh, venture capitalist. We don't need to go to office all the time, but uh, online all the time. So actually, I'm taking my cell phone and uh, working at home most of the time. Uh, I, I primarily I stay at home uh, most of the time. But the the travel just started in China. People can go uh, between the city now as long as they can present their house. We have a house kit. You just uh, uh, scan it and they pre uh, present it to the administrator you are healthy that's all and uh, everybody is primarily a healthy in china at this moment so i think uh, the uh, the situation in china is getting better now but the only problem is uh china has been blocked from doing business with the uh, uh people outside of china because the travel ban is still on between China and outside of the world. So I myself, I'm a US citizen and I have a, a US passport. So primarily I cannot go out of China. Even if I go out, I cannot come back. That's prim primarily the situation. Now. And uh, for most of the businesses getting back to normal in Chinese market at this moment, People start to travel, and also you can see the traffic jam, and uh, people start to uh, getting back to the business. But the investment has been very slow during the last couple of months, and, and still until now, we can see some of the uh, uh, fund become uh, start to looking into the company, but uh, still they are looking to the familiar uh, people's and familiar face they don't tend to invest into new area or new business. So I, I think it's still taking a couple of months for the business to come back to completely normal. So getting back to uh, your portfolio, so as you said, you, you have invested in five to six uh, 
digital health startup company. What has been the uh, the impact of the crisis on the on these startups? Uh, it's very uh, <coughs> the situation is very different. Some of the company actually uh, <coughs> benefit from this uh, epidemic or this uh, situation. I think the the major or the keyword for the small business in this kind of situation is adaptive adaptability. Adapt. So if you can change according to the crisis, sometime you can catch the business. One of the example is uh, uh, we we have a company doing molecular diagnostic for cancer patients, and nowadays uh, when they realize there's a uh, infectious disease. Uh, problem going on, they develop the kit very quickly and uh, they actually benefit from this kind of situation. And another digital house uh, company, they uh, previously they tend to uh, recruiting patients for the pharmaceutical company and now they are uh, to, to accelerate their business online to marketing the product for pharmaceutical company to their customers. So actually, uh, if you can catch the business, uh, catch the opportunity, it's a, you can turn the crisis into an opportunity. But most of the business tends to slow down. Uh, if you have an offline business, primarily uh, nobody uh, <coughs> uh, for uh, the clinical trial is completely stopped during the last couple of months. Uh, a lot of the company, uh, you see some, some of the company, they recruiting the patients, the digital, digital house, is uh, doing the electronic record or doing the IT business for the hospital, most of those business tends to stop. And uh, so it, it is a, a very different situation for some business and compared to others. And the key word here is the adapt, adaptabilities. Okay, so that was my, my second question because you were saying that uh, uh, depending on the companies, some had some benefits, some had to, yeah. to stop their activity. Uh, in any case, yeah. they had to, to adapt. What is your main learnings about uh, these humans, about uh, the company of your portfolio and maybe other mm -hmm. companies? Yeah, I think well, one of the problem for small company is the limited resource. You cannot sit here waiting the crisis going out like the big company. But one of the advantages for small company is you can change quickly. You have a small group, you can make decisions very quickly. You can change your business online or you can adapt your business seizing the opportunity. So I think uh, uh, for the, whatever the small company, even if you, you, either you're in the digital house area or not in the digital house area as the adaptability, but for this, uh, I think this is an opportunity for a lot of the digital health company because everybody tries to get online. The hospital tries to get online because they, they can't have as many patients as, uh, um, as possible because the patient doesn't want to go to a hospital anymore. And the doctor, uh, they want to get online because uh, they, uh, they don't see the patient as normal situation as much. So the hospital want to get online. So if you have a very good online platform, then you can recruit a patient quickly. I, I think uh, one uh, of the slides I'm going to show you is uh, the, uh, the, the China is uh, very ahead of the curve for online business, not only for the consumer good, but also for the healthcare as well. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I, I was in the McKinsey lecture the other days, and they show uh, lots of good pictures they see, uh, you can see some of the business as quickly adapt to online business. And digital house is, uh, is the free front runner for this, uh, this kind of situation. So one of the uh, example we have is uh, the, uh, one of the company we invest is providing the IT service for the hospital. So the hospital was previously was very reluctant to have everything online and now the government required them to register all the patients online and then having all the doctor to provide the service online and have all the patients to provide the electronic record online. So the hospital need this service quickly 
and this uh, venture, this uh, startup company, get this business quickly because the hospital doesn't have a chance to compare other company, and then they can wrap a big profit for this kind of uh, situation. And the same thing uh, for the pharmaceutical company, they are having problem recruiting patients uh, in the normal ways because they can't access the hospital anymore. And then some of the online digital health company can help the pharmaceutical recruiting patients online, and then they can get a big business for this kind of situation. So that uh, that's uh, two of the good example uh, for the uh, digital startups. So I think the money still come in China. The money only come two uh, uh, revenues in the startup. One is the hospital. One is the big pharmaceutical companies. So if you serve them well, you are the winner of this situation. And so this, yeah, at this moment, everybody trying to get online. So if, if you help them to get online business, you are the winner of this kind of situation. Okay. So now. Um... Uh, that that's really great great examples how do you see the future uh, for chinese uh, startup for your portfolio companies and if you have yeah. something to share some advice to share yeah i think uh, uh, at this moment it's hard for me to predict the whole future but something is very obvious is uh, everybody now try to get their business online and not only on to the uh, on to the computer internet but uh, on the cell phone, on the mobile, uh, mobile business. So if you are, if you are in the digital house, you have to think from your client point of view. And in China, the client is only two categories: hospital and the big farmers. So the hospital want to get online is to want they want to retain their patients. They want to provide a medical service online. They want to get their medical doctor online. They want to, uh, uh, the hospital might not be as crazy or as crowded as it is before, it was before. So they want to get their medical doctor online. They want to have patients to uh, change the habit to pay the medical bills online. I have the medical uh, video conference to uh, present them, uh, to send the diagnostic and getting the sample from the patient at home and to provide the diagnostic test result online on the mobile phones. I think that's one of the opportunity for a lot of startups. If you serve the hospital, you should look into that area. And for the pharmaceutical company, I think pharmaceutical will less depend on the distributors. They will depend on more on direct to the consumers. So if they want to direct to the consumer, which is the patient, they will advertising more on the on, for online business. They want to have the patient community. A lot of the big pharmaceutical company already expressed the interest to have a patient community themselves. So you will help the uh, big pharmaceutical to manage those patients and to uh, select those patients and maintain this patient interest to the pharmaceutical and the patient education because a lot of pharmaceutical companies, they don't have the experience to direct the patient. Most of the time, they, they are very good at the selling the drug into the hospital, selling the drug to the doctors, but they are not very good selling the drug directly to the patient. So you have to help them to communicate their message to the patient. So I think that will be another big opportunity for the start, startups. Well, thank you very much, uh, Adam, for all these uh, great insights. So uh, thank you for sharing this and, um, and have a good day. And uh, hopefully we can uh, do some business uh, together uh, in the future. Thank you. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm glad to help. So that was amazing. As uh, we uh, hear uh, from, this, uh, from this video, first is that uh, the world post-COVID will be completely different from before. And uh, second, uh, what Adam told us is that uh, startups, uh, some will disappear and every other startup uh, will have to adapt and change probably uh, to pivot 
uh, to benefit from uh, these uh, new opportunities. The third thing is that both hospitals and uh, pharmaceutical company uh, will go more and more online and will become completely digital. And because as a conclusion, what was seen to be impossible in the, uh, the pre-COVID world is now become obvious. So now that we see what's the situation in uh, China, uh, can uh, now let's go to other parts of the world and uh, start with, uh, with Singapore, Thailand. Uh, so Sebastian, what's the situation, especially for the startup ecosystem uh, in uh, East Asia? So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the question. I think um, the startup ecosystem is obviously very big here. So let me talk from the perspective of our startup. Um, and uh, there we have to understand, of course, that, that Excel has developed a, a deep tech part, which is really wet lab, rare cell isolation and characterization, and but also a digital part. So both parts are impacted in very different ways. <clears throat> um, our, our wet lab part, where we, where we are running clinical studies, um, is severely impacted. No doubt, uh, we, we were running studies in Singapore, uh, validation studies to show, um, to, 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 to validate our prostate cancer det detection assay. Um, that has stalled because hospitals are focusing on COVID. <clears throat> but on the digital side, where we, um, where we now add AI to the actual, to actually um, issuing the diagnosis to analyzing the slides we create, um, that I want to say has, has been positively impacted um, because um, we, we, we do this uh, with, with groups in England, with groups in, in other parts of Europe. Um, and because everybody is forced to work virtually, this, this everybody up this uh, equipment at home, so it's much easier to work together now. So this AI part, which is very, which is now a very important phase for us, um, has accelerated and uh, um, to create actually a, a cloud atlas of atypical cells in cancer patients now um, has become a, a, a. There's a lot of light at, at, at the end of this of this tunnel for our cloud atlas. So that's a very positive development. <clears throat> um, at the same time. As I said, I, I, I um, relocated temporarily back to Thailand where it all started. Um, and I had time to focus on stuff I had not been able to do over the past year because we relocated headquarters to Singapore. I was of course running our, our funding round. Um, um, and I'm now back at, back at the microscope looking at other cancers actually discovering new cells yet again. So um, I think what, uh, what we just heard um, with just a bit of flexibility, you can turn it around into an opportunity at, at various levels. So Sebastian, that's exactly what uh, Adam was saying is that yeah. uh, some are still, uh, you see other opportunity and especially in the AI uh, software uh, arena. What about uh, money, investment? Uh, what's the situation? Um, we were, I guess, well, there's always a good bit of luck involved in startup life. So we have been um, we have been fundraising for the better part of well, I think it's it's over one year. So we were just about to close our round when COVID hit, and we were actually able to raise uh, during the crisis more. Uh, we were just thinking of expanding the round, uh, the, the round because, because as I said, our clinical studies are heavily impacted, so that will cost us time and money. Um, and uh, some of our legacy investors um, approached us and asked if they might be able to invest more. So it's looking very good, uh, surprisingly good, I want to say. Um, and um, it's also nice to see that, that this work we've put into funding over the past uh, 18 months um, uh, is, is paying off and we are able to do this in a, in a virtual uh, manner still. Okay, that's really great. Thank you, Sebastian. So let's move uh, back to Europe. And Nuno, uh, can you uh, tell us about uh, what's the situation overall in, uh, in Europe? 
Well, in, in Europe, um, as you know, um, there is a considerable amount of, of dedication from the European Union, uh, the European community, um, and also the, the European Investment Bank and uh, European Investment Fund in, in, um, in allowing the liberation of funds that uh, can support startups to survive this uh, difficult uh, time point. Um, so the the COVID crisis is is here. Nobody really knows at the moment. Nobody can really predict what will be the consequences. It appears that there are some instability in in the markets, um, and the most likely consequence, but it's really difficult to predict, is that indeed uh, investors probably will have less access to new deal flow, so they will not be able to go to, to conferences and to meet new companies. And so it's likely that they tend to invest more as Sebastian just actually just uh, communicated um, in, in companies that already that they already know or that they already have invested in. Because basically the deal flow is not the same as it was uh, five months ago. Let's say. Um, so, and at the same time, this, this, this applies to VCs, but for business angels, it's, it's also very difficult to predict. Uh, so we know that a large amount of uh, investment, early stage investment is uh, performed by business angels. So these are private individuals and it's really difficult to predict how they will behave. It may be that they will retract from investing, but at the same time, it can also be that they invest more in companies that in which they believe. So it's 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 quite difficult to to predict the market. Okay, so now, there will be different behavior. Uh, right, right. New startup will it's going to be probably a bit more difficult to raise money. Correct. But for existing company who have already raised money, just like uh, Exer, uh, probably there will be more money available. And Precisely. when we prepare together, um, we were also discussing about what's going on in the in the U.S. because the U.S. Is usually at the uh, the forefront of uh, the investment. And uh, what's your opinion about what's going on in the U.S. and especially compared to Europe? So you you know that for for companies um, uh, usually uh, there is a considerable more amount or easier access uh, to private investment in the U.S. than than in, tends to be in, in Europe. So investment in Europe tends to be a bit uh, lower into companies and uh, a bit more prioritizing certain needs. Um, but what we see right now in Europe comparing with the US is that in Europe, there are several public instruments that have been put in place. So for example, that I don't see right now in the US. And these are for the rescue of startups. For, for example, um, uh, EIT Health, where I work, uh, we just released six million uh, to support um, a COVID-19 um, uh, urgent rescue mechanism uh, that has been uh, developed uh, in, in a partnership with our partners. So EID Health is, uh, is, is a public-private uh, institution. So basically we receive funds from the European Union, but at the other side, we also have 150 partners that are um, uh, all across Europe and that these are um, uh, uh, hospitals, they are uh, universities and they are also industry. And so basically what we have seen is that uh, after this release of the 6 million for this uh, public private projects, there was indeed uh, lots of commitment uh, from consortia to really to submit and apply new projects to, to, to solve uh, COVID-19, uh, the COVID-19 problem. Uh, but I just learned yesterday that EIT uh, just released 60 million uh, as a rescue instrument for uh, small and medium enterprises in, in Europe. So uh, we can see uh, lots of activities from institutions in, in, in Europe to release funds that will allow the survival of um, of sm small and medium enterprises in Europe. As in the US, um, until now I have not seen that. So it's more indeed, um, as we said, it's more a relationship with a private investor that will be able then to, to support um, the survival of, of uh, SMEs right now. Um, and as we said, most likely 
companies that already have strong relationships with investors have uh, more probability of raising funds right now as a brand new startup that's just starting a fundraising. In okay, the US. so the good news is that uh, there will there is already plenty of money in Europe, uh, which is uh, a good uh, sign for European startup and of course for other startup around the world because uh, right. Europe is uh, one of the places to be. Uh, getting back to uh, to Sebastian, uh, so uh, uh, Sebastian, how do you see the future post-COVID world in terms of uh, opportunities, especially uh, uh, coming from uh, this uh, the health system? Uh, do you see some changes, and what are your main learnings from uh, this crisis? Yeah, um, maybe to start with the learnings first. Um, I think the, the learning is really a reinforcement of what I realized through painful learning before, which is that you, you need to from a startup perspective, you need to build your team well, because um, when I follow these startup blogs um, of other startups, I see a lot of what do we do now in this in this virtual environment? How do we do this team building? What about the culture? How can we build the culture? But I think culture is built on the team. So if the team doesn't click, you cannot build your culture anyway. But if the team clicks and especially has clicked before, then this um, social separation over continents is actually not difficult. I mean, we, we meet on Zoom, uh, we have a Friday evening, uh, you know, beer session over continents and, and it's not much different from before, except that we're not in the same room, but we're in a virtual room. So I think that is really a, a, a reinforcement of that. We really have to get the team right, uh, then you can survive many things. And uh, in terms of the future, as, as we mentioned, obviously digitalization is not going away, it's going to get more. And I think, especially in, uh, from a health perspective, that's very exciting because had you asked me six months ago what I see as our obstacles, I would have said, well, we are making the cloud atlas, but I, I don't know how ever we will get this through any regulatory authority to have patient images in the cloud and then doctors looking at this and uh, some AI bridging it. But I think COVID teaches regulatory authorities we have to move forward. There's no other way. And I think that that's very positive. So I'm very excited about, about this new dynamics, which we don't see just yet. We just start to see, but it, it, it will come. And on the other hand, I just want to um, throw this into the ring as a food for thought. Uh, what I find very interesting is that now here's this virus and obviously Many people are very afraid, um, especially we are afraid for the elderly, for the for the weak and uh, for the immunocompromised people amongst us. Um, and suddenly we can approve drugs in no time, like in, in, in weeks, maybe days, US FDA, everybody can approve drugs like that. Um, if you want to do something about cancer, and I'm talking about just maybe about trials where we take blood and don't even feed back the results to patients, it's months of IRB clearance, and I, I don't know what. So it's there's a there's a that we're talking about extremes here. Suddenly, treatments become very easy to approve, and for cancer, which which does kill 25,000 people a day, you go through months of approval to take some blood. So I hope we can meet in the middle in the future and, and you know, take one step back and say, if this is possible for this virus, can we do something about the cancer epidemics, which is maybe a little bit more efficient and conducive to innovation. So that, that, that's what I would hope. Okay, so that's really great insight. Uh, Sebastian, if I try to summarize, uh, the, the first thing is that uh, uh, the industry is, of course, going completely digital, and uh, it's now really obvious, and there is a big, big acceleration. The second is that even if everything going digital, human relationship and human connections are much important than even before, and especially for startup. And last thing is that health is becoming a priority. So things that tend to be to be slow now are becoming fast because uh, it's becoming one of the priority uh, both for 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 countries but also for for the economy well th thank you very very much sebastian and of course we will finish with uh, with nuno and uh, the same question uh, nuno uh, what are the main learnings from uh, this crisis and how do you see the future 
So I, I agree with the previous speakers and, and I think that there is a crisis, but there is also a moment of opportunity. Okay. So we know that telehealth is a old topic, but it has been very difficult to implement worldwide. And now finally we see governments understanding that um, digital solutions and telehealth solutions, for example, are a must in the in the in the future. So basically, and that's not the only opportunity. There are many other opportunities in, in the digital field. But finally, the, the policymakers are learning that indeed new solutions are required. And indeed, small and medium enterprises are learning that they can pivot what they are doing right now in order to address problems that have just arised. At the same time, Europe has released uh, 37 billion uh, euros in funds for supporting small and medium enterprises in different forms, from which 8 billion are managed by the European Investment Fund uh, to support small and medium enterprises. So basically, there is also, even if there is potentially uh, uh, a different method for raising funds, funds are still available in Europe. And, um, and basically, in any crisis, there is an opportunity. So we can look at the glass half empty, but we also can look at, at it half full. So you can pivot, you can try to um, uh, develop a solution uh, for the current problems that are currently um, very much uh, public to everyone. And, and there is funds in Europe that uh, people can access with work and with commitment. So basically a bit of more Well, thank of you story. very much, uh, Nuno. That's uh, also a, uh, a great message. So once again, just to summarize, of course, digital, it's obvious. Second is uh, human and uh, human relationship. And of course, uh, it's also about money because money uh, will go more and more into uh, startups, into digital, and into uh, the health industry. Uh, so thank you for this big insight, and thank you for having uh, us uh, travel all around the world. And I, now I give the floor to, uh, to Pascal for uh, the conclusion. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much, Didier, and thank you. this conference uh, from the very beginning to the very end. I hope uh, you, you had enjoyed it. Um, we learned a lot of things today uh, from pharmaceutical company, from investors, uh, from um, regulatory and from, uh, in, from uh, public authorities like uh, EIT Health and uh, Europe. And uh, in addition to your conclusion, Didier, uh, I, will ask, I, will, I will add something that um, uh, the example, the example of China is very inspiring, and, and especially uh, hospital and pharmaceutical and the medical devices company have to uh, do uh, online business more and more, and uh, this will happen thanks to digital. So to all um, startups that are listening to us, please come to us, of course, come to Arno, and to all pharmaceutical companies that are listening to us, uh, come to us as well. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Arno, do you want to add something? Well, I think we, we all agree here that with every crisis also come the opportunities and that weeks in us now become imperatives. So I really want to stress that now is the perfect time to be more ambitious in our collaborations uh, because that's how the future uh, of business will be done and that's also uh, because the world needs it. So. Uh, yeah, you can count on us to help you turn those collaborations into success. Thank you, Arno. I want to thank very much, uh, as usual, um, uh, all the um, Digital Pharma Lab and the Hello Tomorrow team, and especially I want to thank uh, two people, to Yed Bunouf, who has been, uh, as usual, very instrumental in making this uh, conference a success, and uh, the the realization, uh, the, the, the the editing of this uh, of this uh, YouTube uh, broadcast has been done by uh, by Damien. So I thank you also, Damien. So uh, just uh, as a big, big, big thank you to, to everybody and goodbye. Have a great day today. Bye, everybody. Thank you, thank you to Singapore. Thank you to Le Hague. Thank you to everybody everywhere. Bye. Thank you and goodbye.